Good morning, lovely friends. How are you all today? I hope you're well. I'm still a bit sniffly from my cold, so excuse how I sound. But I thought I'd just make the most of this beautiful, bright morning. I've had to move my chair, in fact, because look, it's <laughs> so bright, gorgeous, to catch up with you at the end of month number 19. I know I say it every month, but I honestly don't know where time goes. So this month, well, it's been quite interesting for me. I think I've generally been at a bit of a slower pace this month. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna need my water to hand. My throat's still really sore. Yeah, definitely a much slower pace this month. As you'll have probably gathered from the fact that um, I was absent from the garden for the best part of three weeks. All sorts going on, which I, won't, I don't need to go into. Um, but also this month, I don't even know how to begin the subject for today. <laughs> well, you'll have got it from the title. I've been looking at the gentle art of Swedish death cleaning. Now, before you all run away and get freaked out by the D word, death, yes, I've said it, this is not meant to be in any way maudlin or morbid. Actually, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, I think it's really quite liberating, which I will expand on. So, <clears throat> I had a couple of... Um, really quiet days at the start of the month, wasn't feeling too well. So I thought, oh, I know, I'll do some of that kind of, you know, that sort of sorting stuff we all do from time to time. So just to put this all into context, I've never been a huge consumer of stuff. Um, just never really have been. And also living in a really small place, my flat here is only about 600 square feet. I simply can't consume too much because there's nowhere to put it. But even when I've lived in bigger places, I've still not been a massive consumer. And I've been reflecting on this a lot this month about where that's all come from. And actually it goes back years. Part of it is because of my I never know how to put it. A part of it is because of my desire to be conscious in how I consume in terms of the resources that have been used, the people who've made it. You, I mean, you know how I feel now about um, how green a product is or how ethical, that sort of thing. But going back years and years and years ago, I remember seeing an article in one of the weekend papers, it was probably The Guardian, do you remember, I don't know if they still do it, I haven't bought papers for years, but uh, at the weekend you used to get a colour supplement, big glossy colour supplement with lifestyle stuff, fashion, reviews of theatre, what have you. And always the first part of the magazine would be some sort of photojournalism. So I remember seeing this article, I don't know, it could be 15 years ago, it could be 25 years ago, I don't know when it was, but it had a massive impact on me and I can still see the images to this day. The whole article was about possessions, what, what we as families accumulate in our homes. Very simple but really high impact photojournalism. What they did, whoever the photographer was, sorry I can't remember, they took families from all over the world, absolutely all over the world, and had the family sit outside of the front of their house with all their possessions spread in front of them. Apart from furniture, I don't think they did furniture. So it was just, you know, bedding, clothes, all the stuff from their kitchen, toys, books, etc, etc. And um, all the families they used were all, you know, ordinary sort of middle income type families. So not the poorest people, not the richest people, bog standard average people for that country. And what was 
actually, in a way, really quite shocking to my eyes then was in particular the photograph of the British family and the American family, which were sort of buried in this sea of stuff. And then compared with a family, and I can't remember where they're from, I think it was Ethiopia, I'm not sure, outside their dwelling with just much more pared down, simple lot of possessions. They had floor mats, bedding rolls, cooking pots, some big knives. It's kind of it. So, like I said, that had a huge impact on me at the time. I was thinking, wow, do we need all this stuff? It's just stuff. And it's costing us. We're having to pay for this stuff. Ah, it's mad. So I think all along, I've not been mad with my money buying stuff that I just don't need. I'm really, really quite good at that. I've never found a huge pleasure from <coughs> shopping. I know for some people, Saturday, it's a hobby, isn't it? You go to the shopping mall, you spend all day there buying stuff. Um, but that's never been me. Um... So, the, I don't know when it, this started for me either, maybe about sort of six or seven years ago. I got into a habit, and I really enjoy it, around New Year's Day, depending on my work shifts, I take a whole day to myself, shut the door, shut everyone out, shut all the noise out, maybe just put a bit of music on, maybe have a glass of wine, and I basically, I go through my whole flat every cupboard, every drawer, every box, every nook, every cranny, have a bit of a sort through. Do I really need this? Do I use it anymore? If not, brilliant. Bag it all up and take it to the charity shop. They'll make some money from it. Brilliant. I won't have it hanging around cluttering my house anymore. But that approach has always been um, to do with just sort of not having clutter. And of course, in, in those kind of New Year's Day clutter-busting sessions, I still keep so much stuff, you know, the sentimental stuff, the secret stuff, what have you. Um, and I don't know if any of you um, are, were aware of the, a book. A book came out a few years ago, but I've written things down today because I'm rubbish at remembering names, by a woman called Marie Kondo. I think she's Japanese. And the book was called the life-changing magic of tidying. It's a massive bestseller all over the world. And her approach is a bit sort of wham bam, thank you, ma'am. It's a kind of like a sort of a whirlwind through your home of get rid of this, get rid of that. And again, it's all about the sort of clutter busting, which is fine, and some people need it. So I had that in my mind as well, because I did get given a copy of it, which I read. And I think and this is why I'm, I'm about to come into talking to you about the gentle art of Swedish death cleaning. So about, it was about four years ago now that my gorgeous great aunt had a really bad fall. <coughs> <coughs> um, which actually hospitalised her for a couple of weeks. She's absolutely fine and she's fine now, I hasten to add. Um, and... The thing with my great aunt is she's been feistily independent her whole life. Really, really independent. But also a massive hoarder. Some of you may have experienced either living with a hoarder or having to deal with a hoarder. It's, I, I can tell you now, it's really quite, quite traumatising. So after that fall that my great aunt had, um, when the ambulance men came, they reported her hoard and it got to the stage where she wasn't going to be allowed to go home unless it was sorted. So that's where I stepped in. And <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, it took me six weeks. Six weeks, can you imagine? I had to take unpaid leave, I took six weeks off. I spent seven days a week doing 12, 14, sometimes 16 hours a day sorting her home out. It was traumatic, um, but the point is, 
there was a really, really good goal at the end of it, and that was to get my gorgeous great aunt home and safe again in a much cleaner, safer, slightly more pared down home so that she could move about and be safe in her home. And that's what happened. And she's home and she's stayed home ever since and it's great. Yay! So, sorry, I'm having lots of gulps. Really am uh, <coughs> with this cold. So, I'd been starting to read a little bit about this new thing, the Swedish art of death cleaning. No, the gentle art of Swedish death cleaning. It's by Margareta... Margareta Magnusson. And what I liked about what I was reading, say, compared to the Marie Kondo, which is that whirlwind, just get rid of junk, is the Magnusson approach is much slower, it's more quiet, it's more reflective. And for me, one of the basic principles of it seems to be it's about beginning to shed the baggage of your life while you're still around, and still perfectly capable and able, as I am now, um, rather than leaving it for someone to deal with once you've died. So, for example, just back to my great aunt, if I'd been dealing with all of that after her death, I, I, I think it would have just been absolutely horrific because... I'd want to spend the time thinking about her, mourning her, not wading knee deep through all her, all her junk. So I've been thinking about it more and more and more. And so at the beginning of November, I thought, hmm, let's, let's kind of put this into practice for my own life and just see where it takes me over the next few days. Um, the main thing for me is I don't have kids. So I don't have anyone to inherit my stuff. So who is going to deal with it all when I've gone? Um, is my sister going to have to deal with it all? Is my nephew? In my family, there's only, of my generation, there's only four of us. And of those four, there are only three kids. As in, those, those four of us of my generation have got between them three kids. We're not a big family. So... Who's it all going to go to? Who's going to deal with this when, you know, my time is up? I honestly, I don't, I just don't want to put that on anyone because let's face it, if I live to my great aunt's age, <laughs> then my nephew would be, I don't know, 70. It's not something you want a 70 year old to be dealing with either. Um, so... There have been moments it's been quite difficult, for example, going through photographs and letters. But I realise, you know, I've got boxes and boxes of letters. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Letters, birthday cards. I'm never going to read them again. So why have I kept them? It's crazy. The contents of them, they're all, they're all in here and in here anyway. Those people that have written me those cards and letters, they're still alive, they're still my friends, I still see them, I still connect with them. So why do I need to keep this great box of dusty letters and cards stashed under the bed? The more I started to go through things with that mind of thinking someone else is going to have to clear up my life when I'm gone, the more I thought, it's just bonkers to me hanging on to it all. So, um, it's been really quite liberating. I've chucked loads of stuff. When I say chucked, I've done it, I've done the chucking appropriately, either to charity shops or recycling, <coughs> what have you. <clears throat> With photographs, for instance, packets and packets and packets of photographs. And in so many cases, when you open that packet of photographs, it's a whole roll of film taken on one particular day you know, 36 pictures of the same event. One picture is beautiful. The rest are like, you know, there's always someone who's not quite ready for their photo or whatever. Why keep 35 of those pictures when one could be kept? And in fact, do I really need to keep that one photograph? I, I think, I think it's, 
This exercise, I'm sure, would be very different if you had kids. But, and again, this is not morbid or maudling. When I'm dead, who's going to want to look at photographs of me and what I got up to when I was 20? No one's going to be interested once I'm gone and all my friends are gone. No one's going to even know who I am. So, yeah, the photos, letters, it's been great. Just jettison them all. <laughs> that, those things, I suppose, come under this, the, the heading of sentimental value. We keep things for sentimental value. We feel sentimental about them. And we want, or we hope, and I suppose it's a little bit narcissistic in a way, that one day when we're no longer here, that someone else will feel as sentimental about them as we did. But like I say, I don't think anyone's going to be sentimental about any of my sentimental stuff. So, chuck it, sell it, whatever. Now, there are some things that I have which do have monetary value. Um, I've bought well in certain areas over the years. And I've often thought, you know, um, so with books or paintings or whatever, that that would all be passed on to my nephew. Again, having this sort of slow time, what Magnuson um, talks about is, is sitting with your thing, sitting with that thing, letting it speak to you. Where does it need to be? Where does it want to be? Um, so thinking about the things I have that have some monetary value, if I live as, <laughs> as long as my nan has lived, 99, my great grandma, 97, um, my great aunt is 98, so she'll be 99 in the spring. If I live that long, my gorgeous nephew is gonna be 70 before he sees anything of his inheritance. By the age of 70, hopefully, he'll have established himself. <laughs> So what occurs to me is, wouldn't it be better if all those things that I was thinking about leaving him, wouldn't it be better to give those things to him now? Or, for example, this is what I'm thinking is, all those things, I get them to auction, I get them sold, I open up a little fund for him, a little bank account, because he's still, he's still at uni, he's still, <laughs> he's still irresponsible. I mean that in the nicest possible way. I want him to learn some life lessons as well. So I want him to leave uni without help from his auntie. I was going to say great auntie then. I'm not his great aunt, I'm his auntie. I want him to leave uni and find out what the real world is like in terms of paying rent for where you live, getting a job, all those things. So let him have five years or so experience of that but then maybe when he's 26 27 i can give him a lump sum so instead of him having to wait till i die give him the lump sum now to say there you go you do whatever you want with it but hopefully it can be a little bit towards a deposit for a flat or a car or you know whatever he wants to do with it but surely it'd be better for me to give it to him when he's a young man than wait till he's an old man. So yeah, it's it's been really, really interesting looking at all my possessions on an individual basis and, and thinking about why I've kept things, whether it's sentimental, whether it's because they have an intrinsic you know, financial value, thinking about my family, imagining, sort of starting to imagine where I will be when I'm an old lady, imagining my nephew's life as he grows up. It's actually been a really, really lovely thing to do. Um, I can't imagine myself as an old lady. Um, yeah, I feel far too young yet to start picturing myself as an old lady, but I will be. I will be an old lady one day. Well, I hope so. 
Um, so I've sort of, in my imagination, I've been imposing my face, my current face, on <laughs> my great aunt's body and imagining me being in her chair in her little house and thinking, oh, yeah, I wonder what I'll be doing with my day when I'm 98. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't had a look, I'm just seeing, I wrote loads of bits and pieces down that I wanted to remember um, to say. Yeah, if you, if you haven't had, had a look at this gentle art of Swedish death cleaning, I think the title puts quite a few people off. Have a little Google online. There's some really interesting articles and I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been quiet time. It's been reflective time. It's been a time to be sort of grateful for everything I've had in my life so far and all the experiences of life that have made me who I am today. All sorts of those experiences and thoughts have come flooding back to me. And that's, like I said, that's all in here and in here. Anyway, I don't need stuff. <coughs> I don't need stuff to have that experience. It's... I suppose, in a way, what I'm trying to say is my life has been accumulate, accumulated, or at least it should be accumulated in here, not in all this stuff. So, yes. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Sorry about this. Um, one of the other things um, is those... You know those half-finished or barely even started projects? I'm sure we all have them. I've got a couple of projects that were thought up maybe six, 12 months ago. That's okay. I haven't had time to do them just because I've been doing other stuff and enjoying doing other stuff. <laughs> but there are some things I've had on the go for 10 years or more. And honestly, during this quiet time, I've looked at them and said, come on, Vivi, you are never going to do it. Give it to someone else. Let someone else have the pleasure from it. Yay. So I'm not going to be living in a completely bare house, <laughs> not by any means. But it does concentrate the mind on what do I actually need? There are things I need. I need bedding. I need cooking implements. Mm. I need books, I need entertainment, and books count as entertainment, they're not going anywhere yet. Although, having said that, I am starting to give away some of my books to particular friends who I've always wanted to have particular books, so they might as well have them and enjoy them now, and then they can talk to me about it, and I can see the enjoyment they get from them, rather than, again, if I'm dead, I won't see the enjoyment they get, so I might as well share now. So yeah, there are things I need, and then there are things that I would like to have still. So uh, it's a sort of a William Morris approach as well. For those of you who don't know William Morris, a, a designer, artist from the end of the Victorian era, coming into the 20th century, arts and crafts movement. And he said, and I'm probably going to misquote slightly, so forgive me, but... He said, have nothing in your home that you do not believe to be either useful or beautiful. So yes, I'm enjoying paring things down. I'm enjoying beginning to think about getting things to the people that I want to have these things. And it's incredibly liberating. It feels like this huge weight is being lifted. I don't have to worry what happens all those years down the line. Just get it all taken care of now. Yay! So, <coughs> I'm so sorry about this cough and cold. Hang on a sec. <coughs> That's mostly what I've been up to in this month number 19. In terms of other aspects, money, yeah, it's okay. Um, I've had I had a couple of quite big expenses in September and October, so I'm still trying to work, work, work to sort of make that money back. Food is going great. I've got, I've 
got squash coming out of everywhere. You see, that's another reason I can't, I could never be a hoarder. I don't have space to hoard because I've got squash everywhere. So the food's going great. Money's kind of okay. Um, you know, leave those savings alone. Just leave them where they are. I'm back regularly in the garden now, which is absolutely wonderful. It's not a huge amount to do at the moment, but it's great to just be out there in the quiet. And actually there've been quite a few days when I have been in the garden quietly recently. And this Swedish death cleaning thing has been going around and around in my mind still. It's great. I think um, I'm gonna finish in a minute because I know I'm burbling on. But I think, you know, we, we live in a culture where we, I, I think a lot of us fear death. Um, we don't talk about it. So I hope, I hope talking about this today hasn't made you uncomfortable. Though I would never ever want to make anyone uncomfortable, of course not. But I think it's good every now and again to just remember our own mortality, to not be shocked at the thought that, yeah, there's going to be a day when I won't be here. I just won't be here anymore. And I think what can be really hard is to think that I won't be here and there won't be anyone else around who remembers me. So, if nothing else, that tells me to make the most of my time while I am here and my friends while they are here. Yay! So, I'm going to leave you on that note because I need to fill up my water bottle because <laughs> I can't speak anymore. I know I'm being a huge baby about it, aren't I? I'm rubbish with colds. Anyway, so a little bit of a different monthly thoughts on this month, but I hope, yeah, I hope that's still interesting and thought provoking uh, for you anyway. Now I really am going to say cheerio. Take care of yourselves until the next time I see you. Oh, I'm actually, oh, I'm just thinking about dates and the order of things. So the next time I see you will probably be for a tour of the garden at the beginning of December, because we're about to go into December. Ah! And then after the tour, I've spent ages doing this and it's ready finally. I've done a compilation of all the videos of the kitchen garden over this course of a whole year starting right back last December and coming right up to this December. It's a really, 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 <coughs> excuse me, really long video, but I hope it's the sort of thing that you can enjoy over the holiday period, either watched in chunks or just sit back and watch the whole thing in one go. I thoroughly enjoyed putting it together and looking back over the last year. Not some great moments, or some not great moments, but so many, uh, so many wonderful things to celebrate. So hopefully that will be the next but one video you see. Can't wait. So in the meantime, yes, take care of yourselves, stay snug, stay cosy, stay warm, whatever you're doing. And more than anything, be happy. See you soon.